hello and welcome to today's episode of Chef Talk. I'm your host, Daniela Smallwood, and we are back again with another candid conversation that affects the hospitality and culinary world in campus dining. And so we're hoping that you guys are having a absolutely wonderful day. Today, we are going to have a very interesting and deep conversation um, about the art of eating disorders in communities of color. And so on today, we have a special guest with us who has come to share information with us and really help guide us through this conversation. And so as a part of Campus Dining, we understand that, you know, it's our job to make sure that you guys are fed, you have great food, uh, but we want you to have a good relationship with food. And that is what we're going to talk about today. And so we have with us Robia Smith-Herman, and she is the team leader and supervisor at Renew uh, Re Renfu, excuse me, Center in Raynor, uh, Pennsylvania. And so uh, we're happy to have you today. Hey, Robia, how are you doing? Hi, I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm more than happy to be here this morning. Great. Well, we're, we're so glad to have you today. Um, and we're excited about you coming on board. Do you mind just kind of sharing a little bit about your background and kind of how you got into um, a role like this? Absolutely. So um, I'm a clinical social worker by training. So um, I went to the Graduate School of Social, social Work and Social Research at Bryn Mawr College. Um, but I completed my undergraduate work at Gettysburg College in psychology and Africana studies. And so I think, of course, it's, it's super important to talk about education and, and educational background and how that shapes your, your clinical practice and shapes the direction that you go in your life. Um, but I also think it's like really important to talk about what I like to call or, or what um, sociologists like to call social location. Um, so I identify as a cisgendered female who is multiracial, um, and that's part of my like social location. And I grew up in Silver Spring, Maryland, um, and I currently live in Philadelphia. So I know that these are some specific things about my social location, and there's a ton of other um, things that kind of connect to social location, because those are the things that kind of pushed me into this field, right? So um, I, and I note them too, because there's a lot of culture that's associated with these locations, just as on the college campuses, you know that your college campus has its own kind of culture. It has its own vibe. It has its own feel. Um, so there was a culture at Gettysburg, a culture at Bryn Mawr. There's a culture that's associated with being an individual who's multiracial or, and growing up in a household with a lot of different um, racial and ethnic backgrounds that are present. There's a culture of being female, right? Or being a cisgendered female, I should say. And so all of these things influence the way that I see the world. I, I interact with the world, the way that I interact with people. And so as a social worker and a clinical social worker, um, I'm really aware of my social location and I'm aware of the social location of the patients I work with. And when we kind of look at that and, and kind of filter through that, hey, like I see the world this way, you see the world this way, um, I have a better understanding of how to connect with you. I have a better understanding of how to access you know, something in my personal history that allows me to empathically kind of respond to another person. And so when we're talking about like clinical practice and, and therapy, that I think is of utmost importance. And everything that I learned as a female, as a multiracial individual, as, you know, a person who studied psychology and Africana studies, as a person who studied um, social work, like leads me to the way that I work with individuals with eating disorders. Um, I first entered the field, um, let's see, just about nine-ish years ago. Um, I, I started working as a substance abuse therapist, um, but then I worked. I started working with eating disorders just about six years ago. Um, and I'm drawn to the population because, again, like the, of, of social location, I, you know, I'm going to harp on that one more time, um, our community members present with such unique social locations, right? And in order to understand the development of an eating disorder and how to 
um, treat an eating disorder or, or support an individual through recovery, it's really important to, to understand the person in their environment and the person in their social location. And so um, that's a very kind of abstract way of, of how I got to, to what I do today. But um, I was always um, an empath, like you can look at my my progress reports from second grade, from first grade, and it always says, Robia is really empathic, she's really great with people. So I always felt like I was gonna be a, a helper uh, and in the helping profession. And through, again, my like social location, this is the way that I have found the best way to be a helper, um, to support people um, in therapy. Excellent. Well, I love the fact that you talked about social location. I think, you know, one of the things that we're seeing, especially in communities of color and in campus communities across the board, is that there is a lot more communication about the power of therapy, how important therapy is, um, you know, in, in our lives and how it can really begin to bring us forward. And that social location and really understanding, you know, as you're choosing a therapist, I think is really important. I know even in my own personal life, I've been very particular particular about who I've chosen because that has really been what allows me to either you know have a good experience or not so good experience in therapy so I love that you talked about that and I think that's great for our viewers to be able to understand how do I make that decision mm -hmm. so as we're talking about eating disorders today do you mind just kind of to lay a foundation of you know what are eating disorders what are maybe some of the common eating disorders so that we all have the same foundation Sure, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, you have your clinical di definitions of eating disorders that you can find in like the diagnostic statistical method, right? The DSM, um, and that is, of course, very important and is used to diagnose eating disorders. Um, and there are certain criteria that individuals have to meet in order to be diagnosed with an eating disorder. Um, some of the most common types are anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, um, binge eating disorder, and one of the, I guess, more newer eating disorders to make it into the DSM is called other, other specified eating and feeding disorders. So, you know, I can run through a couple of them. So for anorexia, the key traits of anorexia are um, self-imposed starvation, denial and restriction. And so what that kind of looks like and some of the early warning signs um, might include a distorted body image, a preoccupation with food, calories, nutrition, exercise that leads to a denial of hunger cues. Um, so when you when your body alerts you that it's hungry, you try to numb that out and, and deny that. Um, so that you know leads to the restriction of, of intake. So a question about that before you go to the next sure. one is there's a huge um, kind of wave of people doing a lot more intermittent fasting or even regular fasting. How does that play into anorexia? Can that feed into, you know, that type of eating disorder? It can. Um, so intermittent fasting or fasting in and of itself is, is actually really harmful and really dangerous um, for a number of different reasons. When you are fasting, you're, you're pushing your body into starvation mode and our bodies are not supposed to be in starvation mode, right? Um, and if there's a problem, um, perhaps due to social location, then sure, okay, we can look at that from a different perspective of how do we help you get access to food if you are struggling with food insecurity. But self-imposed starvation or intermittent fasting can really mess up a lot of the systems within our bodies. It can it mess up our hormones, it can mess up our metabolism. And I think a lot of these new packaged things that are coming out of, you know, try intermittent fasting, try all of these things um, is under the guise of, of diet culture. And this is going to make you look better and everything's going to be wonderful. And the reality of it is it's really going to mess up a lot of your systems in your, in your body um, and including your brain, right? When we think about um, eating disorders, I think a lot of times we think about it just purely in your body um, and trying to kind of like shrink or, or, or make yourself look a specific way. But when you restrict intake, particularly carbohydrates, where I know a lot of these intermittent fasting um, kind of guides and, and keto guides tell you to restrict carbohydrates, 
you, your brain really suffers. Um, carbohydrates are one of the key things that our body needs to produce serotonin. So there's a real reason why when you don't have carbs, you're cranky, right? Because your brain doesn't have serotonin and, and you're not, um, you're not kind of functioning from a mood standpoint effectively because your brain's not working. So things like intermittent fasting um, or, or, you know, however they're packaged nowadays are really harmful. And when we restrict um, our intake and we kind of push ourselves into that starvation mode, what ends up happening is we become overly hungry and it can really sometimes start a pattern of restricting and binging. And so it can lead to um, really harmful disordered eating patterns. Wow. Wow. That's great information. And I think that's something that, you know, right now is so popular. And, you know, like we talked about, we really want to kind of dive into having those healthy relationships with food. So what are some of the other common ones? You talked about anorexia. Um, How would you define bulimia and the other one that you mentioned as well? Sure. So um, bulimia nervosa, um, the key trait of, of bulimia is a repeated cycle of out of control eating followed by some form of purging. So when we talk about purging, um, I think sometimes the first thing that comes to most people's mind is like vomiting. And that is one of the types of purging, but we like to really expand the definition of purging. It's anything that really negates the caloric intake. So it could be um, excessive exercise. So you eat something and then you work out in order to like negate the the calories that you just took in. It could be use of laxatives or diuretics or or diet pills or things like that. So that's the key trait of um, bulimia is um, out of control eating followed by some type of purging. So, so even like right now, I know it's really popular, the skinny teas and things like that, not used correctly, those could be unhealthy as well. Is that what you're saying? So those are things that we would classify as um, a form of purging, um, detox teas, tummy teas, um, like the tummy lollipop things that are all um, advertised on social media. They are, they can actually be used in two functions. They are, they use to help with restriction for anorexia, but also if you are using some of those things after you eat, there is somewhat of a laxative or diuretic function to them. So it can also be used as purging. Gotcha. All right. And then what about the other um, common? uh, Sure. So um, binge eating disorder. Binge eating disorder is um, the key trait for that is um, compulsive overeating. Um, And so some of the warning signs include eating large amounts of food when you're not physically hungry Um, eating alone because of shame and embarrassment. And there's also a connection of a history of weight fluctuations. So perhaps, you know, going back to that intermittent fasting cycle, um, you know, when you are fasting and maybe if you're able to to do it long enough, um, you might see some weight loss, um, but then you might become again, overly hungry and your body is kind of struggling with you because it's not supposed to be at a lower weight. Um, Everyone has a set point. So our bodies want to be and gravitate towards where our bodies naturally settle and where they're most healthy. So if you are restricting and then you're binging, that is kind of creating a a history of weight fluctuation. So that is also a key trait of binge eating disorder as well. Wow. Wow. This is such a great conversation. You're hitting so many areas uh, today. Um, Do you mind elaborating a little bit more about the set weight? Because that's something you don't commonly hear people talk about. No, no, not at all. And I think a lot of times people are very focused on BMI instead. So your body mass index. And um, I think lately and, and Luckily, there's a lot of kind of emphasis on the fact that like BMI is not is not what we should be looking at, right? So BMI um, was actually developed by a mathematician, not a physician, and he explicitly stated that BMI should not be used for clinical practice, which I think is really interesting. Um, it was used uh, or created rather for for white individuals, specifically white men. Um, and is not indicated for any other body type. And so one of the main flaws about BMI is that it does not take into account important details about age, sex, bone structure, fat distribution, and 
that's particularly important for uh, BIPOC, Black Indigenous people of color, because um, BIPOC individuals have a greater bone density and or greater like muscle mass than white individuals. And so your BMI is going to be completely out of whack if you are looking at that kind of, uh, I guess, program that, that this individual used to, to calculate BMI. And so when you are kind of put in these categories um, of, you know, healthy weight, overweight, so on and so forth, there's this kind of push to try to get your body to go into a zone of healthy weight based solely on BMI. But the reality of it is that people can be healthy at every single size. And um, that when we're taking into consideration different body types and different bone structures and fat distributions that every single human being has, people are going to be falling on different um, kind of weight trends that are not kind of categories categorized rather by BMI. And so when we really focus on the fact that every single person has a weight that their body naturally settles at, right? So it is not um, something that you're forcing your body to be at or a weight that you're forcing your body to be at. It's where you're naturally setting, settling, where you notice that your body actually doesn't fluctuate from weight. Um, maybe for females, when you are in your menstrual cycle, there's ebbs and flows with water, you know, stuff that, that happens, but otherwise you kind of are hovering at the same kind of location on the scale over and over and over again. That's your set point weight. That's where your body really wants to be because that's where your body is going to work the most effectively for you. That's where you're going to feel the best. You're going to have the most energy. Your brain's going to be working. All of the systems in your body are going to work, be working. And sometimes that has absolutely nothing to do with where your BMI is because they're two very separate things. Um, and, you know, our goal for eating disorder treatment at Renfrew is to allow your body to naturally settle where it's supposed to be. That, that is such um, a new and almost liberating mindset to have when it comes to um, having a healthy relationship with not only eating, but a healthy relationship with your size as well. Um, mm -hmm. And just the way that you were created to be. And so when we have this conversation, um, I know that oftentimes in, in communities of color, these are conversations that are often talked about. And so how do eating disorders really affect communities of color? That is, that's significant um, for sure. I think um, before we kind of talk about like maybe more of the statistics, I think it's important to think about that there's a really different clinical presentation um, for eating disorders in communities of color because communities of color are dealing with different things than other communities, right? So, you know, we can go back and we can look at the same idea of social location and we can think about, something like historical or intergenerational trauma or um, systemic oppression and all of these things that uniquely impact communities of color. And so when that, when we think about it from that perspective, you know, there's other things that are, um, that individuals of color, BIPOC individuals deal with that, that maybe Caucasian individuals don't, right? So there's social cultural impacts like colorism, for example, that has an impact on eating disorder development, um, something like interpersonal microaggressions, right? Like if you are constantly experiencing an onslaught of microaggressions, that's going to impact how you see yourself. It's going to impact your social location and it's going to impact um, the development of an eating disorder. Um, <clears throat> we know that um, from the ACEs studies that came out years ago, that individuals of color have um, greater acute life events that are, are looked at as stressors. So it has um, significant impact on biological factors like chronic illnesses. Um, and so all of those things have an impact on eating disorders. And then we also think about something like the, the strong black woman stereotype, right? So this idea of like prioritizing care for others, um, motivation to succeed um, despite limited resources, perceived obligation to present an image of strength um, and resistance to vulnerability and dependence. Um, and so all of those things kind of result in some of these like internalized ways that we see ourselves based off of the environments or social locations that we're in and can lead to the development of eating disorders because there's almost this 
um, resistance to being vulnerable and saying that something is wrong. And we don't want to admit that, hey, like we're struggling because we're supposed to um, be so resilient because we've made it through all of these things and, and we're supposed to just succeed. And so as a result, some of the things that we see are that um, it's 50% of, of Black women um, are, are showing symptoms of bulimia nervosa compared to um, their white counterparts. And another thing that I think is, or, or I should say 50%, Black teenagers are 50% more likely to exhibit bulimia, bulimic behavior. Another thing that's interesting too is the way that it's perceived from external sources onto the community. So again, we are supposed to be these strong black women. We're not supposed to have anything wrong. We're supposed to just keep going and going and going. And so there's a study that when presented with identical case studies demonstrating disordered eating symptoms in whites, Hispanics, and black women, clinicians only identified 17% of black women's eating disorder behavior as problematic compared to 41% of Hispanic women and 44% of, of white women's eating disorder behavior. So that idea that there's a strong black woman that we've made it through all these things and, and that nothing phases us and we just keep going is detrimental. It can be really harmful because not only do we internalize it ourselves, it is seen from um, external communities into our community and therefore we're less likely to be di diagnosed with things that, that are affecting the community. That is such good information. And so my question to you is, as we've kind of talked about these challenges, how can a person kind of self-identify that they may need help in regard to eating disorders or their relationship with food or their body in general? Sure. Um, I think that's a great question. And it's, it's a tough one because oftentimes when you are struggling with an eating disorder, you may not be aware of the fact that like the patterns of behavior that you're engaging in are harmful. Um, but, you know, it's important to think about warning signs for other members of your community. So if, if you see someone who maybe is going to the bathroom after meals really frequently, that might be an early warning sign for something like bulimia. Um, if you are noticing that someone is, um, all of a sudden there's there's a behavioral shift at, at meal times, right? Someone who used to be really jovial and engaging and, and um, talkative at a meal and, and enjoyed food, all of a sudden they're not doing that anymore. That might be a um, warning sign that they are struggling with their relationship with food. Um, I think, you know, we also are looking at um, some of the medical complications that, that come up with eating disorders. So if you yourself are finding that you have this like increased level of fatigue or brain fogginess, like that could be that you are not um, um, having enough nutrition, um, hair loss, weight loss, of course, weight gain can be an indicator of, of eating disorders or um, a difficult relationship with food. Um, and of course, there's way more um, uh, medical complications that, that can arise, you know, bone density concerns, losing your period, all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's, it's important, I think, that individuals who are close to some, maybe someone who's struggling with an eating disorder know some of those, the warning signs that they are able to kind of help that individual maybe identify that it's time for them to get some additional support because sometimes they're not going to identify it themselves unless they really are understanding, oh, wait a second, this is a, a really maladaptive or negative way that I'm managing stress or managing my emotions. And um, once you kind of notice that or you identify that, you know, with someone that's important in your life, how, you know, what are some tips on going about helping to support them through that process of getting help? Absolutely. Um, I think the first thing I would note that it's important for anyone who's identified as a support, you also need support, right? Like, I think I go back to the, the commonly used phrase where it takes a village, it does, it takes a village, right? If, if you are the only person supporting someone who's struggling with an eating disorder, you are going to 
be overwhelmed. You're going to be burned out. You're going to start to kind of have your own emotional experiences in relationship to supporting that individual. So you also need support, whether it's a therapist, whether it's another community, um, church community, um, anything within your community that you frequently access, that's going to be really, really important. Um, I think the next most important thing is to respond from a place of empathy. You know, I go back again to the idea of social location and recognizing that my experiences and my social location might be different from yours. But if I can tap into my experiences, knowing very, having a really good relationship with my experiences, I can find something that um, allows me to really feel what you're feeling and respond to you through empathy. Um, which is going to help us be connected and help me support you more effectively. Um, we want to make sure that supports, we're not like silver lining anything. So we're, you know, if someone's struggling, we're not saying, you know, well, hey, at least you're not, you know, throwing up, right? If, if you're, if you're restricting, hey, at least you're not throwing up, but that, because that really can be invalidating and cause disconnect. And we really want to make sure that our supports and individuals with eating disorders who are struggling are, are really connected because again, it takes a village. Um, and so I think the last thing too is to be open and to be patient. Eating disorders oftentimes don't make sense, right? It doesn't make sense that because of an emotional experience I'm having, I am engaging in a behavior with food. Um, and so particularly for individuals who are not struggling with eating disorders or eating disorder symptoms, to really understand that process, it, it, it's hard. And so to be patient and to be open as your loved one or your support is working through their recovery, those are, are some of like the best tips I can offer because it's going to take a while and to have that patience, to have that support and to have that empathy are going to be key. Excellent. And so um, are there any resources that you recommend uh, for someone who is trying to work through having a healthy relationship with food? Absolutely. So um we're filming this now at actually the end of, of NIDA week, so National Eating Disorder Awareness Week. Um, so there's a spotlight on a lot of resources that are available um, during this time. Um, I would say, you know, first and foremost, the Renfrew Center where I work has a great collection of, of resources on our website. So www.renfrewcenter.com. There is a whole section that says resources where you can find guides, um, educational materials, resources for coaching coaches and trainers and teachers and community members that help, again, with that point of if you are a, a support and you see someone struggling, these are really good resources to kind of hit on those key things of what you might be looking out for and how to approach someone who's struggling with an eating disorder to, to help them get into treatment or help support them. Um, if you are seeking treatment, Renfrew Center is the um, the first eating disorder facility in the country, um, and we have over nine, or we have 19 sites total. Uh, we have two residential facilities, but we also um, have um, we're also offering virtual programming due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so that there is actually a little bit of more of an ease to access treatment if you are struggling. Or we are noticing that there's an increase in eating disorders due to the pandemic because of the isolation, because of the stress, because of everything that's been going on within our world, people are you know, engaging in, in eating disorder patterns because it is a way to help manage the distress that, that they're experiencing. Um, again, I noted that it's need a week right now. Um, so the National Eating Disorder Association also has a great website that um, has educational information and local resources. Um, I also think one of the, the cool things about social media is that there's a lot of really, really good quality resources on social media. Of course, there's the, the negative side of social media, but there's some really awesome resources um, on, on Instagram, for example, of, of BIPOC, for BIPOC individuals. Um, Therapy for Black Girls is one of them. Um, there's a couple more that I can't think of off the top of my head, but there's really great Instagram handles to follow as well that that can be um, open up the door for additional resources and additional support. Excellent. Well, we just want to thank you uh, for 
being here today and allowing us to have such a serious conversation um, that needs to be had. And so we appreciate your time. Is there anything that you want to leave our viewers with today? What would be your final thoughts? Sure. Um, I think one thing I, I might want to leave you all with is the idea that maybe one of the common um, misconceptions about eating disorders is that they're disorders of food. And sure, you know, food is a part of eating disorders. But, uh, and the second thing is that eating disorders only affect a certain population. Um, and these stereotypes are harmful because eating disorders don't discriminate. And at the core, eating disorders are not about food. They're about connection, right? So they're emotional disorders and they're disorders of disconnection. And I think we go back to what I was talking about before with that strong black woman stereotype and, and the historical and intergenerational trauma and all the things that are going on currently in our world with you know resurgence of civil rights movements and all of those things and that can lead to feeling disconnected and feeling like our emotions are so distressing that we also need to disconnect from our emotions so if we think about eating disorders as disorders of disconnection and emotional disorders rather than eating disorders being disorders of food we understand that the food is just a way to help manage the disconnect. And when we repair and when we heal that disconnect, that's when we can start to really see a reduction of the behaviors and the symptoms. And so it's so important to make sure that you are connected. And if you're noticing that you're starting to feel disconnected in any type of way, to talk about it, right? The stigma that exists in mental health and the stigma that exists uh, for eating disorders, particularly within BIPOC communities is pretty significant. And the more we talk about it, the more we're going to be connected rather than disconnected and the better access we will have to resources and support to help heal the relationship with food. Excellent. Well, we want to thank you guys for watching today's episode of Chef Talk. I'm your host, Daniela Smallwood, and we'll be back with another conversation that surrounds campus dining, the hospitality industry, and culinarians abroad. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.